had got, brought Kyle White on because I've known him for years. We uh, used to do a, a series of seminars that we used to bring to you locally called Plain Dollars and Cents. He's my go-to guy when it comes to questions about aircraft insurance policies. But you don't get to listen to him yet because first I'm going to promote a new book I wrote to you. So bear with me and watch this video. And when you're done, I need you to go onto Amazon sometime today and buy it. I have it set at a special price of 99 cents. I know you can all afford that. And then I immediately need you to, after you read the book, which will take you maybe an hour, I need you to go to Amazon and write a review. Many people have asked me why I wrote my new book, this book called The Equality Police. So I'm going to tell you right now. I realize it was time for me to call out socialism for the cancer that it is on free enterprise and capitalism. I also realized that I had become a practicing socialist in my business, which really struck me right at my core. Here I was extolling capitalism and conservatism to use the current definitions, and yet I had been running my business as a liberal. I was allowing people into my life that only took from me and seldom gave back in exchange. I never created a culture of choices and consequences and seldom confronted people with their lack of production. Worse than that, I was paying people to come to work and give less than 100% of their efforts during their shift. I was failing to hold others to what I considered to be my standards and worse than that, I was failing to hold myself accountable to the standards I was preaching. And I run my mouth all the time preaching what I believe. That is what this book is about. My growth as a business owner and a human being and doing the massive action it takes to beat my competition in the marketplace. This will be your first steps to dominating the market, whatever market you choose. If you want a foundation to build a path to create wealth for you and your family, put the lessons I learned the hard way into your arsenal and attack this current culture with an attitude of doing whatever it takes. I look forward to your success stories based on the lessons in this book or your frustration and how you hated it and how it ruined your life. Maybe you could write your own book to stamp out the effect mine has had on the world or even better we can create a webinar series of us arguing against each other's philosophies. Let's do it. So there you are. And that was directed for you too, Kyle. So you have to or buy a book today, spend all of 99 cents, which I know will break your piggy bank, and uh, then write a great review. Anyway, here is Kyle White, personal friend, aviation insurance guru, and uh, it's all yours. Thank Take you, Tom. Good morning. Thanks, Tom. Good morning. My name is Kyle White, and I am the aviation practice leader for Marsh and McLennan Agency, which is the middle market division of Marsh and McLennan Companies here in the United States. So while we have experts in all lines of coverage at Marsh McClendon Agency, I specialize in aviation and lead the team to help people like you make sure you have the coverages you think you have or you think you might need. So in today's se seminar series, we're going to be talking about how to customize your aircraft policy. So this is what I ask people when they call me and ask me for an insurance quote. I want to understand what their, what their needs are and what their buying philosophy is. So I asked them, did you buy the cheapest airplane that you could possibly find out there? Or did you buy the airplane that best fit your needs? Some people's needs may be met by a Baron. Some people's needs may be met by a Cessna. Some people need a King Air. It depends on what the mission at hand is that you're trying to accomplish. You didn't go out there and say, you know what, I'm going to buy the cheapest airplane possible because the cheapest airplane possible may not meet your needs. Aircraft insurance should be purchased the exact same way. You need to understand what your needs are, what your exposures are, and whether or not you want to insure against those exposures. So many people just buy on what they understand, and so many people just understand price. They have commoditized what it is they're buying. So today, we're going to talk about 
how to not buy off of just price. While I recognize price is important, it should only be one of perhaps 30 items that you're checking the box on when you're comparing and contrasting what is best for you. So we'll start from the beginning. So much of my competition sells insurance just off of the aircraft whole value as well as the liability limits and the premium. Those are the three things that primarily people are, are looking at. So to give you a kind of a background on what, what we're looking at in terms of the current market, there are over 15 insurance companies that are writing aviation policies. This has created a buyer's market. About 12, 13, 14 years ago, there was only three to five markets really quoting little airplane insurance to business jets. There weren't too many options. And when, they, when you, the buyer, don't have very many options, then the pricing is going to be high, and the options uh, in terms of the ancillary coverages are going to be very low. Well, as more companies started coming into the marketplace, they attempted to differentiate themselves with their ancillary coverages, which is going to make up the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. Now, it is important to understand that we may be at the bottom of the current aviation insurance soft market cycle, which again has been going on for well over 10 years now. And an indicator of this is we are now seeing some markets exit the business. So in second quarter of 2018, we really started seeing some clients getting a three to 5% increase. If you are a large fleet operator and you have some loss history going on, then you may end up seeing some stiffer increases. It all depends on what your experience is in terms of your flight times, your operation, the type of aircraft that you're operating, and again, the losses on what your increase could be in 2018. Another factor that's going into this right now, not just price, but is also the ancillary coverages. So where we were able to negotiate a, a significant amount of enhancements, it is becoming a little bit tougher to get the ancillary coverages we want. But when I compare and contrast that, when I say it's a little bit tougher, it's just a little bit tougher because it still is a buyer's market with, again, well over a dozen companies right now writing aviation insurance. So again, today's topic, we're going to be talking about ancillary coverages and what, they, what may be available in the marketplace. My goal for you guys, after this presentation, you'll be a more informed buyer again. So instead of just comparing and contrasting the whole value, the liability limits, and the price, you're going to have some uh, good background and education to ask some intelligent questions to your aviation insurance broker. You're also going to be under, able to understand what some of those ancillary coverages look like, too. I'm, my goal is for you to be able to ask intelligent questions. And I think by asking some of these questions, you'll find very quickly whether or not your insurance broker is very transactional or whether they really do have a true understanding of what it is uh, that you need and what the aviation insurance industry uh, may need from a coverage standpoint. Additionally, some clients, when we go over these ancillary limits, they may say that some of these coverages just aren't important to them. Well, if those coverages just aren't important to you, perhaps you can go back to your broker and say, these coverages aren't important to me. Is there any premium considerations for removing some of these coverages or reducing some of those limits? So let's talk about some of the policy basics. And I'm going to make my screen a little bit bigger here, so bear with me just one moment. the aircraft physical damage, the liability limits, and the premium. So let's take a look at the physical damage piece of your aircraft policy. This company agreed to. You should be setting this value based on current market conditions. I always recommend to our clients that you buy insurance for the aircraft to replace it with like, kind, and quality in today's market. Sometimes the value of your aircraft may go down. Sometimes the value of your aircraft may go up. A great example right now is the growth and the explosion of the need for flight schools. So therefore, Cessna 172s have seen a dramatic increase in value over the last year or two. Another example of where aircraft insurance may be going, uh, or the, the values may be going down, would be if you bought a brand new Cirrus. 
Cirrus manufactures over 300 new aircraft a year. Again, going back to supply and demand, because they're pumping out so many of them, the values tend to fall uh, versus some of the other aircraft where they may be only uh, putting out 20 or 30 a year. So again, look at the agreed value and ensure for what it costs to replace it with like, kind, and quality in today's market. Some of the extreme examples of underinsuring or overinsuring your aircraft could be this. If you overinsure your aircraft, it is the insurance company's best interest to make sure that they get it repaired versus totaling it out and sending you a check. Because when they total it out your aircraft, they're going to turn around and they're going to sell the salvage value, the aircraft for salvage value. And their goal is to minimize how much it costs them out of their pocket to get you back in the air or to total your aircraft. So you might may find yourself in a situation if you're overinsuring the aircraft that you get an aircraft repaired and get back to you, they send it back to you, an aircraft that you wanted total. Uh, here in the Kansas City area a couple years ago, we had a situation where a microburst came through a local airport and damaged literally 30 to 40 airplanes. Some of these aircraft owners had a great experience with their claim situation and some not so much. And one particular situation came to mind where an insured really wanted their aircraft totaled, but it was a $300,000 Mooney. And so in order to get it totaled, we had to do a lot of work to make sure that the numbers came out to the insured's benefit in terms of being able to get it totaled. They did not want that airplane back uh, repaired. Another example is if you insure the airplane for less than market value. If you do this, here's the exposure that you're putting yourself in. You may find that the insurance company comes to you and says, you know what, uh, we've done some numbers and we think that we're going to total your aircraft. And you get to look in and you say, well, I'm only insuring my airplane for 100000 The market on these airplanes have come up. And in order to replace it with light, kind, and quality in today's market, it's going to cost me $150,000. Well, now all of a sudden you found yourself self-insured for about $50,000. So you don't want your, your aircraft uh, totaled. Unfortunately, they have the right to do that. So now that we understand why we should insure it for uh, what it would cost to replace with light kind of quality in today's market, let's talk about the deductible options. Again, with the soft market, we've really seen deductibles go away. There's very little premium savings to have deductibles on your policy. Some of the insurance companies are still holding on to those, and they may be $50, $250, the number varies for in-motion or not in-motion deductibles. But I just did an insurance policy on a Baron 55 with a $200,000 whole value and a $2 million liability limit, and we still had no deductibles on that policy. And when we went to the, ins the insurance company and asked for about $5,000 deductibles, there was no premium savings. So we just left it with the no deductibles. So again, aircraft value, that's a major part of it. So now let's talk about the no-fault coverages. Well, medical coverage could be a no-fault coverage, and so can guest voluntary settlements. So the medical coverage, again, this just blows me away when I see some of the policies and how low they are. They could be as little as $1,000 or $3,000 per person. Well, have you thought about what it costs to ride an ambulance or just go to the doctor for an emergency room visit? $1,000 just doesn't go very far. And here's why it's important to have that higher. The insurance company will pay for any medical situation that you or your passengers may find themselves in. I've had a gentleman that was working on his airplane, and he, he cut his head open uh, when he was uh, underneath the aircraft. The insurance company paid for him to get stitches in his head. I had another situation that this personally happened to me. I was giving an airplane ride to a friend. And he was exiting the airplane. I don't know how he did this, but he tripped and rolled off the back of the airplane wing. His head dented the flap on our Bonanza, and then he also hit his head on the ground. Well, the insurance company makes it where the gentleman does not have to sue me. We just go to the doctor, get some medical bills, write a report, send it to the insurance company, and they reimburse us for this. The guest voluntary settlements, something that, that could be negotiated in your policy, and a lot of times for no additional cost. It's about a, a baseline, a minimum, would be $100,000 per person. Why is this important? Well, some of us are giving friends airplane rides or taking them from point A to point B. We're not really taking strangers with us, right? These are people that we, we socialize with. And we really don't want to get in a situation where they have to sue us or we sue them. So the guest voluntary settlements is just that. The insurance company can settle with that person that gets hurt on our behalf. 
So they just signed a document saying they're not going to sue us, and here's some money for your inconvenience and uh, your troubles, whether they be medical situation uh, or you hurt their feelings or you scared the heck out of them uh, by flying through a thunderstorm. And again, that's something that a lot of times can be added to your policy for no additional charge. The third piece is the liability coverages. We've seen anything from as low as $500,000 of liability coverage, sublimit of $50,000 per person, to coverages as high as $500 million. I mentioned the Baron earlier. That gentleman is in a unique situation in that he's elected to carry a $5 million policy on his Baron. Again, that is kind of unique. Most people only carry a million dollars of liability coverage for single-engine and multi-engine piston-powered airplanes. But I also attribute to that to a lack of understanding of what the policy does and doesn't cover, as well as what their exposures are. And another thing you need to think about, too, is, this, in a way, this is kind of a prepaid legal plan, because the insurance company has a duty to defend you, whether you are negligent or not, and you get sued, the insurance company is going to hire a defense counsel, and they're going to consult with you, and they're going to defend you against any lawsuits. But once the insurance company feels that you may be in a situation where you're going to owe the policy limits, then they are going to walk away. Because once they have paid out the policy limits, they no longer have a duty to defend, defend you in court. Now all of a sudden, those costs of legal defense will become your problem. So be certain to understand that the higher the liability limits you carry, the harder the insurance company is going to work to defend you. Now here's a big thing that people uh, find themselves in if their policy is set for uh, not going to cover a claim, and that is the pilot warranty. The pilot warranty is a condition in the policy. The condition means that you have to meet certain criteria in order for them to pay a claim. One of the criteria is the pilot warranty. It could be as simple as anybody approved by the named insured. That means anybody can fly the aircraft. But it could be as complex as stating that the pilot that you allow to fly the aircraft needs to have a commercial license, an instrument rating, a multi-engine rating, 3,000 hours total time, 2,000 hours of multi-engine time, 500 hours of make and model, and 100 hours in make and model in the last 12 months, and must have an IPC in make and model every 12 months. It can be very complex. So those are the, the basics, if you will, of an aircraft policy. So now let's talk about the ancillary coverages. This is really the guts. This is, this is where a policy can be really robust or be very weak in an off-the-shelf solution. So I mentioned earlier about guest voluntary settlements. This is a very, very important item within your policy. Because again, a lot of times the people that we are taking in our airplane with us, they're friends. We don't want to get in a situation where we sue them. If you are in a situation where you hire professional pilots to operate your aircraft and they're independent contractors, again, this is a very important piece, guest voluntary settlements. The reason I say independent contractors is because if you employ them from a W-2 standpoint, Workers' compensation is the first line of defense, and you should have a workers' compensation policy in place to cover, to cover your employees that are operating the aircraft. So here is a list of quite a few ancillary coverages that we're going to go in detail and tell a couple stories on. There are more ancillary coverages than just what we're laying out here, but for the sake of time, these are the ones we're going to cover today. So family assistance. This is a great coverage that really came into, into play within the last, oh, I'd say, three to five years. And think about the situation, and again, I apologize, but in the, in the business that I'm in, I'm always thinking worst case scenarios, and I'm always thinking about um, bad things that happen in aviation. So when we think about what happened during 9-11 and the aircraft that, that uh, crashed, when we think about the families that were involved, and we think about the emotions that were involved. And we saw on the news how many families were going to, to visit these crash sites to try to bring closure to what, what they're going through. Well, the family assistance plan is just that. Under the aircraft home liability policy, you could have this coverage endorsed onto your policy. So heaven forbid something bad happens, the insurance company is going to pay for the cost uh, sometimes up to 12 months beyond the, the loss. And it's going to transport your loved ones 
and all the costs associated with doing so to the site of the accident to try to bring some emotional closure uh, to that situation. And the family assistance plan, it could be as little as $1,000 or it can be significantly higher than that. So think about what it would cost to get your family members uh, to, to the site of an accident and work with your broker to determine a value that you would want to assign to family assistance. Another item that we're going to talk about here is breach of warranty. The breach of warranty is something that typically is only found on certificates and endorsements to your lien holder. So if you happen to have a lien on your aircraft and you owe the bank money on it, if they are intelligent, they are going to have a breach of warranty. So we talked about the pilot warranty and how that's a condition of the policy. Well, if you violate conditions of the policy, that is grounds for the insurance company to deny the claim. Well, if, the, if you violated, say, that pilot warranty and you had an accident and, say, the aircraft is, um, par it doesn't matter if it's partially damaged or total. The insurance company is not going to pay to fix it if it's partially damaged. And if it's a total loss, they're not going to pay uh, the total loss on that. So now all of a sudden you have an aircraft and a, and a, and a ball of heap that is worth nothing. And the bank is going to say, well, that's fine, but you still owe us so many dollars on this aircraft. And the insurance company is not going to pay the bank. However, if you have the breach of warranty clause within your policy, they will pay the bank. Now, the wording is different amongst different carriers. Sometimes the wording will say that they'll provide a breach of warranty up to 90% of the insured value. Well, if the market has come down on your aircraft and we're now insuring it for less than what you, you purchased it for one year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago because of depreciation or just the market value as a whole, you're now insuring it for less. But say you amortize that airplane for, for 20 years. You may be upside down in your aircraft policy or you may owe uh, right at 100% of what the, the aircraft is insured for. So if you have a breach of warranty clause on there and you're with an insurance company that only provides 90% of the insured value, you may be self-insured for a few thousand dollars. So it's very important to read the war wording for the breach of warranty to make sure that uh, there are no surprises. Heaven forbid the hangar falls on it and you did something to violate your policy and you owe money on it. Another item that is of very importance and is very well misunderstood is the per person versus the per passenger sublimit. There's one insurance company out there that we work with, or that we, I'm sorry, that we don't work with, and it's called a Vimco. A Vimco sells the insurance directly to the insured. So you have no representation to go over these coverages with to make sure you're buying what you think you're buying. In addition to that, their policies typically are limited to a per person sublimit. Well, what's the difference between a per person sublimit and a per passenger sublimit? Well, there's a, a lot of aircraft operators and owners out there of single engine piston airplanes that are buying a, a policy that has liability coverages of a million dollars that's sublimited to $100,000 either per person or per passenger. Well, here's a great example of the difference. In today's day and age, you know, we get sidetracked quite a bit looking inside our cockpit versus looking outside. We're looking at our fore flight. We're looking at our taxi diagrams. We're punching in our flight plan, whatever the case may be. But say we're doing a slow taxi and we're on the ramp. And say somebody, a person, runs out in front of the aircraft and we accidentally taxi over them and we cause bodily harm to them. Well, under the Avimco policy, that's a million dollars sublimited to $100,000 per person, you only have $100,000 of, of liability coverage for the bodily injury that you caused to that person. Whereas the bulk of the policies that brokers work with from the carrier standpoint is a million dollars sublimited to $100,000 per passenger. So that same situation, you would actually have a million dollars of coverage, not 100,000. So it's very important to understand the difference between a million dollars sublimited to 100,000 per person and per passenger. Another great example of this is we had a customer with a G36 Bonanza and they had a mechanical issue, the engine failed, and they landed on a road and they caused a car to go off the side of the road. Well again, the, the people in that car are people, they're not passengers of our airplane. So under an Avemco policy, 
he only would have had $100,000 per person. Under his policy, he had a million dollars in total. Damage to non-owned hangers. So if you find yourself in a situation where you are at a transient airport or perhaps even at your base airport that you do not own the hangar and your aircraft is inside that hangar and it does something or you do something to cause damage to that non-owned hangar, you want to make sure that you have some coverage in there. And again, the, the limits vary. I've seen it as low as $10,000 and I've seen it as, as high as $500 million are the types of, of limits that you can have for damage to non owned hangers and, and their contents as well. So talking about hangers that you do or don't own, that leads us to the next one of hanger keepers coverage. So I remember when I used to fly for a living, we went to a, um, another hangar at another airport in our aircraft, and when we were there, they graciously offered to put our airplane into their hangar for the night. And we said, that'd be great. Well, at that time that I was flying for a living, I didn't know much about aviation insurance. I didn't think anything of, think anything of it. Well, when they offered to take our aircraft and put it inside their hangar, they have their tug, they latched onto our aircraft, and they pushed it back into their hangar. If they would have damaged our aircraft while they were put in, in their hangar, our aircraft was in their care, custody, and control. So if they had hangar keepers coverage underneath their policy, that would cover the damage that they did to our aircraft. Well, if you're a nice enough person and you're allowing people to be in your hangar and you latch onto it, uh, their aircraft, or it is in your hangar and the door is shut and you're walking around it and you somehow damage that aircraft, that could be hangar keepers coverage. So it's important to understand how much coverage you may or may not have under the hangar keepers uh, limit. Fire and crash response. So, again, you know, when we look at um, uh, some of the situations that you could find yourself in out there, one of the things may be at the end of the runway, they're now putting uh, foam at some of the airports. So if you overrun the, the runway and you find yourself in that foam, you know, you now have done damage. Uh, in addition to that situation where there may be emergency uh, personnel at the airport because maybe you declared an emergency or whatever the case may be, or maybe you just failed to put your, your gear down and you had a gear up landing. That's where the firing and uh, crash response can come into play. Or if you um, are have an off, off-site airport landing and fire and crash uh, response come into play. If you're in a rural area and it's a volunteer fire, uh, fire department, you may find yourself in a situation where you get a bill for those services. So you want to make sure that you have a decent amount for fire and crash response. And again, I see limits all over the board on this. Some are very low and some are very respectable. Emergency off airport landing. So what's interesting about an aircraft policy is in order for the coverages to be triggered, there has to be an occurrence. An occurrence is typically defined as bodily injury or property damage. So it could be uh, damage to your aircraft or it could be damage to uh, a third party's uh, property or bodily injury. Well, what if you find yourself in a situation where you're flying a log in cruise and all of a sudden you start to see that you're losing oil pressure and the next thing you know you've got a hole in your cowling and you just blew your engine and it, and it was a mechanical failure. Well, all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you're, you're pitching for best glide and you're looking for a place to land. Well, if you land in a remote area the insurance company could come back to you and say, hey, look, this is a, a remote area. It was a mechanical failure, um, and there's, there's no bodily injury or property damage, so there's no coverage for this. Well, now you've got to figure out how to get your air, aircraft uh, to the nearest suitable airport or home for repairs. Well, emergency off-airport landing is a coverage that it can uh, come into play where it will get your aircraft back to the nearest airport or home. There's a variety of ways that the coverage can be worded. So it's important to understand the difference between the different policies and how that wording is there or if the coverage is even available within those policies. The last thing you want to be held, held with is the cost to get an aircraft um, out of mountainous terrain and back to a local airport. I reviewed a policy the other day and the, it was interesting how they had the deductible structured. 
and it was the insured's responsibility to get the, the helicopter from where the damage was back to where the airplane, aircraft could be repaired. And if the insurance company had to pay for that, they doubled the deductible. So on this helicopter, it went from being a 10% deductible to a 20% deductible. So when you're looking at an insurance policy, and it may be half of, half of the price of what the rest of the market is, look at the fine print to see why it may be. So sometimes if it's half the price, it's half the coverage, or in some instances it might be a tenth of the coverage. Search and rescue. The good example of search and rescue is Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. So we had some governments that stepped in that were looking for the aircraft. But then after a while they started using some private services to search for the aircraft. Now that's an extreme example of search and rescue and the cost associated with looking for an aircraft. But we recently had a, a, a client and the airplane went missing. And it, it, we found out that the aircraft actually crashed into a lake. But from a search and uh, rescue standpoint, uh, they had a fleet of airplanes. So the insured came to us and said, we think we know where the airplane went down. Can we use our aircraft and get reimbursed to go look for, those, uh, look for that other aircraft? Well, in this situation, we had the policy written um, in a very broad form nature, and we were able to say, yes, you can go do that. So the insurance company reimbursed uh, this operator for the direct operating costs of, of three of their aircraft that went out and looked for this other airplane that was missing. And they did find the aircraft. Extra expense. Here's another very important coverage that you want to make sure that you understand and know if it's important to you or not. So if your airplane is damaged from an occurrence, so there's bodily injury or property damage, and now you need a, a, a substitute aircraft because you still have places to go from point A to point B, this is where extra expense will come into play. So for example, say you have a Baron, and the direct operating cost you figure up on your Baron is say $150 an hour. But if you're going to rent another Baron or you're going to charter another Baron, that may be $450, $500, $600 a flight hour to charter or, or uh, rent a substitute aircraft. Those can add up, that cost of doing so could add up very quickly. That's why you have your own aircraft. But if you have extra expense, the insurance company is going to pay the difference between your direct operating cost of your aircraft and that of the charter bills or the rental bills. You can set up the wording with the extra expense a variety of ways. So it may be a situation where the extra expense just kind of subsidizes, if you will, uh, your, the cost to charter or rent an aircraft. Or it may be a situation where the insurance company is paying out a significant amount of money to uh, cover the extra expense versus what it would cost uh, to repair, repair the aircraft. A great example of that is we had a King Air 200 last year. And it ended up costing uh, close to $400,000 to get this airplane fixed. And it also took five months to do it. Well, the extra expense the insurance company ended up paying out was $800,000. So they ended up paying out about $1.2 million to get this done. Uh, let's see. So that's a great example of extra expense and how that can come into play and why it's important to address that with your broker. Another thing is trip interruption. Here's what's interesting about trip interruption is even though you have extra expense, trip interruption could come into play for a reason you might not have even thought of unless you've had this insurance claim. So I'll share one, a story with you. I had a client that was operating a Gulfstream and they were over uh, overseas, they were in India, and the ground crew uh, at the airport damaged their aircraft. Well, the chief pilot called me. We were working on um, alternate transportation needs and in order to get a chartered Gulfstream into India, it took seven days to get the permit process going. Well, through some facilitation payments, here in the U.S. we would call those bribes, but over there they call them facilitation payments, we were able to get the paperwork down to three days. But it still wasn't enough time. The, in the insured had their passengers and they were wanting to leave the next day. So what we did was we utilized the trip interruption coverage. The trip interruption coverage bought last minute one-way airline tickets to get the passengers out of that country and to a country in which we could get a G550 there as a replacement air aircraft and meet them once they got off the airline and then they took the, the chartered airplane back to the United States. Um, a great example of 
the cost associated with that on the extra expense, the insurance company picked up 100% of the difference between the, the DOC of their G4 and that G550. So that one flight alone was about $160,000 that the insurance company personally paid for. But again, that's how extra expense and trip interruption can go hand in hand and why they're both very important. Premises medical coverage is another one that's very important. Here in the Midwest, we deal with ice and snow. And say we have, a, a, outside of our hangar, we fail to uh, provide adequate ice and snow removal, and we have somebody that slips and falls around the premises of our hangar. Well, that's where premises medical coverage is going to come into play. And again, it's very important to look at that liability limit that you have there and see what would be an acceptable amount for you. Often the premises medical coverage does parallel the medical coverage that's associated with the aircraft. Um, another thing that I don't know that I mentioned earlier about the medical coverage is whether it's premises medical or it's uh, medical associated with the aircraft, is it also pays for the cost of, of a funeral. Uh, funerals these days are quite expensive and they're not going to get any cheaper. So when you look at medical coverage, also be asking yourself, last time I went to a funeral for a loved one, what did that cost? And maybe that's a good baseline of what you should be trying to negotiate for uh, medical coverage. War hole. This is a very important coverage that's often overlooked, especially if you're the type of pe uh, person that does not leave the country with your aircraft. War hole covers more than what you, what you might think. I'm going to tell you a couple of quick stories. I was talking to a banker the other day, and he was talking about a Learjet that he financed about 10 or 15 years ago. And this Learjet went down to South America. And when it went down there, it was supposed to be a trip, only last a few days. Well, as they were taxiing out to come home, they had a mechanical situation. So they taxied back to the terminal, and they diagnosed the problem, and determined that they were going to be able to get some parts uh, there to fix it, and they would be able to get a mechanic there to fix it, but it was probably going to take about 72 hours. And they decided, the crew decided, well, we're just going to come on home, and then we'll go back and get the aircraft. Well, when they went back to get the aircraft, they said, where's our airplane? And the local FBO said, it's in that hangar over there. And they said, well, why is it in that hangar over there? And they said, well, uh, the general liked the airplane and decided that he was going to confiscate it for his use. So he confiscated, he seized that aircraft, re, excuse me, repainted it, and put it into uh, use for himself. Well, the insurer was not buying war hole coverage, so the insurance company denied that claim. The insurance, or the, the bank, then was left holding the bag. They had no asset that they could go repossess, and so now they found themselves in a nasty litigation with the borrower of the aircraft and the insurance company to determine who was going to pay this $1.5 million uh, that the bank was now out. So war hole uh, can, can really be a very important coverage if you're leaving the country. Now let's think about if you're inside the country. It also covers strikes, rights, civil commotions, and things of that nature. So a good example of that, here being a Missouri guy, uh, we had our own situation on the east side of the state with, with Ferguson. Think about if the in Ferguson, Missouri, if that civil unrest would have moved over to the airport and it would have started damaging airplanes. That could be a situation where uh, the coverage could be denied if war hole was not, was not purchased. We also had another situation, and this has been quite a few years ago, but the, it was on a $23 million business jet, and the United States government decided to seize the aircraft. Well, there was about uh, a week or two where the insurance company was pretty nervous that they thought they were going to end up paying out $23 million under war hole because of this misunderstanding between our client and the United States federal government. So again, war hole is very cheap. I recommend that you look into it for your aircraft. Host liquor liability. Uh, again, when I used to be a professional pilot, I saw some I saw some interesting things that uh, didn't really mean much to me at the time, but now that I'm in the insurance business, it really resonates. And one of that is when you fly in business jets, you tend to have some people on board that like to have a couple of drinks every now and then. Well, if they're having a couple of drinks on the aircraft and uh, one drink turns into two, turns into three, turns into four, they get off the aircraft at the destination, they hop in a vehicle and they drive away and they T-bone somebody and, and cause bodily harm the lawyers are going to find out where they were served that alcohol and it's going to come back to the business jet operator 
And when it gets back to the business jet operator, the lawyer is going to say, wow, they are operating a business jet. We have some deep pockets to chase here. So that's where the host liquor liability comes into play. Another thing to think about, too, is if you're like me, you like to have hangar parties. Uh, once a month, I invite people out, and we throw some burgers on the grill and make up stories about airplanes. And uh, from time to time, we might have a beer or two. That same situation could, could put uh, you in, a, in a, a situation where they come back, where did that person get that beer or that alcohol? So be sure that you have host liquor liability, not just for the aircraft, but also for uh, your hangar properties. On airport auto, this is another big item to think about too. At my local airport, we had a gentleman that uh, drove onto the airport in his car. He did not own an airplane. He was an independent contractor as a flight instructor. He didn't have any liability insurance, and he ran into one of the flight school's airplanes. His auto insurance company uh, denied coverage because there was an aviation exclusion in his auto policy. Well, if you have an aircraft policy and we're working with you on it, we're going to make sure that you have on airport auto coverage. And it's going to be the policy limit. So if you have a million dollars of coverage, you're going to have a million dollars of on airport auto coverage. So if, if you drive onto the, onto the tarmac and you run into another aircraft with your car, uh, you're going to have coverage to protect you against that. Uh, another thing to think about too is most people, when you look at your auto coverage, sometimes people only buy the state minimums. So the state minimums could be as little as $50,000 or $100,000 of property damage. And under your aircraft policy, you would have a million dollars of coverage. If you have a $5 million policy, you're going to have $5 million of coverage. So again, look at that on airport auto. I can't tell you how many claims we've seen uh, in the business aviation world where an independent contractor that somebody has contracted with for a limo driver drives out to the airport tarmac, thinks they can drive underneath an airplane wing, and they don't quite make it. So it could, it could, if worded correctly, it could also extend to those people that you hire to come to the airport and pick you up. Liability for mobile equipment. Um, again, back when I used to fly for a living, I saw a guy with a scissor lift, and he was driving down the, driving down the tarmac with a scissor lift going from one hangar to another hangar. Uh, fortunately, he did not run into any aircraft out there on the tarmac, but when he did get to one of the hangars, and he was going to work on an aircraft, his thumb slipped on the joystick and he drove the scissor lift right into uh, the, the fuselage, or actually the nacelle of the number two engine of a Falcon 50. So again, think about mobile equipment and if you have coverage for mobile equipment. Um, out at my local airport, great GA airport, you see a lot of golf carts, you see a lot of four wheelers, you, you see a lot of things other than just scissor lifts, and you see people driving them all over the airport on the taxiways and on the tarmacs. Uh, if you got kids out there, I've got some teenage boys, and they love to hop in the, uh, in the golf cart and drive around. Heaven forbid they were, were to run into another airplane, I know with some confidence that I do have a liability for mobile equipment. So be thinking about that coverage as well. Another thing to think about, too, is the, uh, the last bullet point there where I say by having coverage for the same exposure in two different policies, you may be compromising your limits of coverage. Some people will buy an aircraft policy and they'll buy a GL policy, as well as you look at all of your business insurance or your personal insurance. And sometimes there's going to be overlapping coverages in there. Chances are, because I know they're definitely in the aircraft policy and they could be in your other policies as well, that has a statement in there in the fine print that says, if you have other valid and collectible insurance, this policy is excess over that other policy. So now you have a situation where you have two policies with that same wording in there, and they're both pointing at each other. These two insurance companies are going to fight because they don't want to pay. So they're going to say that the other one is responsible uh, for paying. So it's very important that you review all of your policies as a whole to make sure that they are talking to each other and not arguing against each other. And that is one of the reasons that Marshall McLean Agency is very valuable to our clients, is because we have a private client services division that works hand-in-hand -hand with the aviation division and the other lines of coverage, as well as our business uh, property and com uh, commercial lines as well, property and casualty lines. And we make sure that all those policies talk together. And, and sometimes we found, uh, matter of fact, it's happened already several times this year, where a client is paying extra 
for insurance that they don't need because it's actually covered within the aircraft policy. Not only do they not need that other coverage, but they're putting the coverages in jeopardy, again, because of the duplicate coverage claims or uh, clauses. So all of those are great examples of the different ancillary coverages. Um, there are other ancillary coverages, but again, for sake of time, we didn't have time to cover all of them. Uh, it's about 11.45 Central Time. And so with that, uh, I'm going to open it up to, to questions and answers. So if you guys have some questions for me, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, Kyle, this is also, Tom. Yeah, Tom? Can you make the screen smaller again so people can see your lovely face? Because when it's blown up like this, they can't see you talking. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. Let me see if I can do that. Let's see. There we go. That worked. So this, so this whole time, nobody's been able to see my, my shiny forehead, huh? Yeah. Not at all. Not at I all. Apologize. So all of you who are on this webinar, this is your opportunity to ask Kyle questions. And uh, I would appreciate if you would. Um, we probably forgot to remind you that during the presentation, you could always text in questions. Uh, and you can do that now. Um, please do so, or you're going to lose the opportunity to talk to Kyle. And he's worth every keystroke that you send him. He'll give you great answers to your questions. And also, we, Tom, we put up a couple of our uh, links to our website. We have our link to marshmma.com, which is the, the general one for, for all of our services. And they can, they can find us through that link. Or they can also find us through our aviation-based link, aviationsolutionsllc.com. And then there's okay. also some articles. Any questions so far? Not yet. Yeah. Uh, and also, there's some articles out there that I've authored. So if you Google my name in aviation insurance, you'll find some articles that were published in uh, Twin and Turbine, uh, the King Air Magazine, as well as uh, Avionics News. If you want to forward the links to your articles to Shay, and she will make sure that anyone who was on this webinar will get copies of that. All right, thank you. Well, it, it does it looks to me like you've done such a great job of explaining all these things that there aren't any questions. And that is only because of the quality of the speaker and his presentation, I'm absolutely sure. So what we are going to do is probably end this webinar. But please remember before you go, I we need you and want you to buy a copy of my book. It's only 99 cents on Amazon right now. It'll take you an hour, hour and a half to read, and then do a complete review. Please help me out. Thank you. And my thanks is to Kyle also, and uh, an excellent job again, and I will call on you uh, to go over what I'd like you to speak on next time. Thank you. All right, so I'm ending this event.